Join with me in the words of the call to worship a leader and people response. Now is the season of waiting. Now is the season of watching. May we see Jesus at work in the world and rush to help him. Now is the season of hoping. May we share the spirit of wonder and joy with everyone we meet. Then let's rise in body and spirit for our opening hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. God, we thank you this morning for bringing us safely to this place on this day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that anoints us and blesses us, causes us to give thanks for the earth and all of its creation. And so on this day, this day of praise and thanksgiving, this day when we gather in your presence, we invite you to join with us as you have invited us to join with you so that in that synthesis of spirit, we may hear your voice and respond. O oh God of Advent, as we welcome in this new church year, begin something new and afresh in each of us as we acknowledge the difference a baby makes. To God be the glory. Amen. God bless you this morning. Please be seated. It really is, as always, a joy to welcome you to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning, this Sunday in Advent. And whilst we acknowledge that the weather has taken a little turn for the worst, it is nothing like our sisters and brothers on the East Coast and in other parts of the world. So we can put up with just a few drops of refreshing rain as we come to worship this morning. It really is a joy to welcome you. We want to welcome you, especially if you are worshiping with us for the very first time this morning. 
We know that you have a choice in worshiping communities, but we are so glad that you've chosen to be with us today. If you would indulge my spirit, if indeed you're with us for the very first time today, I wonder if you would just raise your hand, keep it up for a moment so that we can see you and welcome you to worship this morning. Please do accept this welcome pack as our way of acknowledging your presence amongst us and inside you'll find lots more information about our church and our community. So please do avail yourself of all of that information. And if you're looking for a spiritual home, we sincerely hope that you have found it with Founders Metropolitan Community Church this morning. You are welcome. We want to also extend a very special welcome to our online worshipers. We broadcast our services live every Sunday morning at 9 and 11 and in Spanish in the afternoon at 1.30. Uh, we are so glad to have so many of you joining us for worship this morning. So please know that you are welcome here amongst us. As the ushers are passing out the welcome tablets here in our congregation this morning where we invite every single person to sign in for us, uh, we also invite those who are worshiping online to also sign in. You'll find that there is a place on that homepage that you're watching right now where you can sign in and let us know that you've been present. And we really do want to hear from you so that we can connect with you wherever you are in the world in the same way that we connect with each of us physically in this sacred space this morning. So welcome to you. Before I go any further, I want to just give honor and thanks to the little elves that were here over these last few days decorating the church. Uh, doesn't it look beautiful this morning? Let's give them thanks and appreciation. Over the next few weeks in our sermon series, What a Difference a Baby Makes, uh, you will see uh, additions to the decorations and also to this tree uh, that has graced the back of our altar this morning. Um, it will be growing as a live, um, a, a, a live event, if you will, uh, throughout the next four weeks. And we are inviting you to bring pictures of your family uh, or of your family of choice, uh, perhaps of you as a child, uh, so that we can add those photographs to this family tree that will be created over the next few weeks. So please do bring those in. Um, if you aren't able to bring them in, you can also email them to us as a JPEG format. Um, and we will make sure that they get added to the tree um, over the next few weeks. But we certainly want to have as many of us on the tree as possible before Christmas Eve. So please do send those pictures in to us. You can send them directly uh, to Reverend Dr. Pat Langlois at revpat at mccla.org and they will be added to the tree. As you came in this morning, you should have received your orders of worship, and inside, if it didn't already fall out, uh, you will find your request for Ponsettias for Christmas. Um, if you would like to dedicate a Ponsettia for Christmas this year, uh, please do fill this out and uh, place it in the offering, or you can also hand it in at the welcome desk, uh, which is in the courtyard directly after worship this morning. There are many announcements for us this morning, but I would just take a few moments just to announce briefly a few things that we want to sincerely bring to your attention. First of all, we would like to say a huge thank you to all who made the Thanksgiving Feast of Love such a blessing, especially our coordinators, Daryl Levitt and Joseph Harris. Uh, we fed not only uh, 150 folks at the senior housing on Thanksgiving morning, uh, but we also then were able to give all of them uh, a takeaway lunch for the next day. And beyond that, uh, we fed 200 people yesterday at our HopeNet food pantry, um, all from the Thanksgiving of love. So please give yourselves a very large round of applause. And there are a couple of things happening for tomorrow, which is World AIDS Day. Uh, first of all, Vienna Star uh, will be having their uh, an annual service. That will be down at uh, uh, Alvera Street, which is right down at downtown Los Angeles. And uh, ECM Coro, which is our uh, choir that sing at the 1.30 service, uh, will be singing at the uh, Placita uh, down at Alvera Street. That is tomorrow evening at 6.30. At the same time, we're also having an Interfaith World AIDS Day service here. Uh, that will be at 7 o'clock. And um, our guest preacher for that evening is the Reverend Steve Peters, uh, the retired director of HIV AIDS ministry for our denomination globally. And he, of course, is with us this morning. 
We really want to invite you to come out tomorrow to celebrate World AIDS Day in whichever format you wish, but we will be here tomorrow for our interfaith service. We'll be joined by Muslim and Christian and Buddhist uh, and Jewish partners um, as we come together to remember World AIDS Day. It's sponsored by POS Spirit, which is our own HIV AIDS support group here and who made this beautiful quilt that is on the front of our altar this morning. I think they deserve a round of applause this morning. And also the Los Angeles Interfaith Clergy Council uh, who are sponsoring this event for tomorrow evening. Today we are honoring World AIDS Day um, and we are delighted to have Eric Loy with us this morning. Um, he is going to be in the courtyard after worship with uh, Paws Spirit and specifically uh, talking and helping us to understand some of the new medications that are available um, and also some of the post and uh, pre-testing uh, um, and also the pre PrEP, uh, and I, can, I always get the, the name of it wrong, but it's the, uh, the PrEP that is available, especially uh, in some of the new medications. So please do not be ignorant about what's going on in our own community. Uh, let's make sure that we keep ourselves as informed as possible. Um, and there are flyers uh, both for men and for women, uh, so please do pick up that information following worship. We do not want any of us to be ignorant uh, about anything that is happening, especially in our community. So please do avail yourself of all of that information. Already reminded you about Ponsettias, so uh, we uh, want to get those in the worship bulletins for Christmas Eve. And while we're talking about Christmas Eve, just very briefly, uh, usually we have two services on Christmas Eve. There's usually a service at 8 o'clock, which is our family service, and then 11 o'clock um, for our midnight communion. This year, there will just be one service at eight o'clock in the evening. Um, that's not because I have a baby. Um, it's, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's because we've noticed that since we moved to this building from our Franklin building, um, that uh, the 11 o'clock service is usually a little quieter than the eight o'clock service. Uh, so this year we thought we would try and bring us all together for the eight o'clock service um, on Christmas Eve. So please do make note of that, especially if your tradition is to be here at 11 o'clock. Um, we won't be. So uh, please, <laughs> uh, please do mark that in your calendars. And so as we come to worship this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn to one another to offer a sign of peace, a sign of welcome. Let's affirm that God is with us this morning as we worship. <laughs> I invite you to be seated for a moment. Many of us have donned red ribbons for several decades. We have been to multiple candlelight vigils in remembrance of those who have died and cast out flickering lights of hope against the shadows of the virus and its prejudices. World AIDS Day always falls with an advent. It stands as the liminal portal between Thanksgiving and our sojourn to the crash. So today we light the first candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. We also ignite our hearts of compassion and hope to honor those taken by HIV and AIDS. And tomorrow we rekindle the candle of hope as we come together for our Interfaith World AIDS Day service at 7 p.m. And on Christmas Eve, during the evening services, shrouded in the darkness, we light our votive candles. As ever, but perhaps more visible this year, Advent is a journey to know the difference a baby makes, and through the darkness with tiny, flickering, tender flames, we ignite our commitment to strive together to focus, partner, and achieve an AIDS-free generation. So a question for reflection as we begin this journey. Perhaps it is a tender flicker or maybe a bright flame. 
What candle of hope are you rekindling and carrying through Advent this year? Our lighting of our AIDS candle and our Advent wreath invites us to respond to several prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, we celebrate your love for us all and give thanks that you listen to us when we pray to you. Send your spirit upon us now and lift us up. Encourage and strengthen us. Instill in us your wisdom and increase our faith. Hear us, O God, as we pray on this World AIDS Day, as we say together. We strive together to focus, partner, and achieve an AIDS-free generation. Hear us, O God, on this World AIDS Day, as we pray for the 15 million children who have lost parents, and for the 3.4 million children who are themselves living with HIV. Empower us to help change conditions that put them at risk, poverty, war, lack of education, and inadequate health care. For the sake of the children, hear us as we pray. We strive together to focus, partner, and achieve an AIDS-free generation. Hear us, O God, on this World AIDS Day, and embolden us to eliminate HIV and AIDS-related stigma and discrimination. Help us break through silence that blocks effective response. Let us teach all who are vulnerable about their means to prevent infection, and let us encourage the frightened to know their HIV status. Let us encourage all who are at risk to seek treatment. In the power of your love, which casts out fear, we pray. We strive to focus, partner, and achieve an AIDS-free generation. Hear us, O God, on this World AIDS Day, and empower us to nurture in ourselves and in our communities faithful stewardship of your good gift of sexuality. Help us to reclaim this powerful gift. Teach us to use and enjoy this blessing so that our sons and daughters may grow in the values of love self-esteem, and sexual health, and your communities may grow in mutual responsibility, justice, and inclusivity. Hear us as we pray. We strive together to focus, partner, and achieve an AIDS-free generation. O oh God, embolden us with your spirit so that we can stop AIDS and keep our promise. Grant that your church may be a healing presence in the face of HIV and AIDS. Show us your vision and guide us to the words and action that will make a difference. On this World AIDS Day, we raise our prayers to you, placing our trust in you for compassion, healing, and courage in the struggle to stop AIDS, to keep the promise. Hear us and answer us according to the richness of your mercies. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise as we prepare to receive the reading of the Gospel. Today's scripture is taken from Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 16, the New International Version. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line, who will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen.
invite you to be seated. And once again, invite you to pray with me as we open our hearts and minds to all that God has for us this morning. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and anointing one, this is your day, the day that you have made called us to rejoice and to be glad in it. And so we ask, God, that we might come with that sense of celebration of giving thanks to you so that in our preparation for this Christmas season, we might be aware of the difference that your baby made, not just 2,000 years ago, but continues to make as we open our hearts and minds afresh and anew to you. So still us now, and may your Spirit touch us in new and remarkable ways. And now, gracious one, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, in whom we pray, amen. So we begin a new sermon series for the next few weeks as we prepare ourselves for this Advent season and for Christmas, and then, of course, for the celebration of a new year as we come to ministry together. And as we were planning this particular series, I was uh, engaging with the creative arts team uh, of our church as they met, and I just basically gave them the sermon series and said, it's what a difference a baby makes, and they laughed because they thought it was all about Sophia, uh, and I reminded them that, of course, yes, having a baby in your life does make a huge difference, but this isn't really about the baby that, that has now entered into our family. This is about this baby that has entered into this family that we call church, this community that we come to experience week in and week out. And they came back to me and they said, you know, we really think that we could uh, create something around a family tree to remind ourselves of the root of Jesse that came from Jeremiah, this root that begins at the very beginning of creation that has seen itself all the way through the Hebrew Scriptures, all the way into the Christian Scriptures, and touches us more than 2,000 years later. And over the next few weeks, you're going to see this branch that is above our altar this morning, and it's going to grow, and it's going to move, and we're going to add things to it, and we're going to remind ourselves that this child that was born more than 2,000 years ago is still the root of all that we have, not just in Jesus, but even before Jesus, through all of the Abrahamic faiths to remind us that we come from a huge line of history, of a faithful tradition that comes to us this day and engages us with new and exciting ways, and we are a part of it. It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It continues to transform our lives, and the baby of Christmas is the one thing that we use as a touchstone of the reminder of open the window, here it comes. Open the windows of our hearts, open the windows of our lives, open the windows of our circumstances, open the windows, for here it comes. Here comes this spirit of joy and celebration that we get to engage in every year. I know I've said this before, and I always bear repeating that sometimes I wish that the Christian calendar only celebrated Christmas every five years and not every one year, because sometimes you wonder what on earth you're going to speak about fresh and anew uh, for this, this Advent series and this Advent sermons. But the truth of the matter is that this story is fresh. This story is new. This story is a story of liberation, and it's a story of hope, and it's a story that has transformed so many and continues, if we allow it, to transform us today. In the busyness of Thanksgiving, in the busyness, busyness of this season, we all must take that opportunity to open the window, and here it comes. But I have to ask ourselves, what is it that is coming? What is this Advent series? What is this Advent time? What is this good news that is really coming to us? And how has this good news been converted or even perverted over the years of the Christian tradition? What is this good news that we have come to inherit, and maybe it's not the news that many of us feel comfortable with, because so often the story that we have been sold 2,000 years later is not the fullness of the story. We've made this story look so pretty. 
Indeed, we pretty up our churches every year to enhance the prettiness of the celebration. But the truth is the story of Christmas is not a pretty story. It's the story of a, of, of a baby born homeless. It's the story of a, of a child born to parents who were not yet married. Even, even the understanding that Mary and Joseph were betrothed has been clouded in this myth that Jesus was born to a, a nuclear family. And yet we know that Jesus was born into a one's parent family where Joseph probably died soon after he was born and Mary was beholden to the disciples and to the other folks in the community to find her worth and to find her status. This story is not a pretty story. It's a story that ends in death and destruction. It's a story that would revolutionize the, the empire and the empire as we knew it. It's a story of a young man who would challenge the status quo of a young child who would go to Jerusalem and be caught speaking in the temple and talking to the religious right about their hypocrisy. It was a story about a child who would grow to challenge us today to also challenge the status quo of our lives and to challenge the status quo of the systems and the structures in which we live. It's a story that we've made pretty but it's not a pretty story. It's a story that should unfold within us and convince us to make a difference in the world. It is the story of a child that made a difference, and yet you would look at the Christian church today and wonder what difference has it really made. We have glossed over, made look pretty, and not challenged ourselves to make this Christmas story the truth of what it is. And in this last week, we've had the opportunity to think about the ugliness of our world. Now, I don't want to get into too much of the political um, or the politics of our world, but you know Jesus did not back off from political systems or from the political world in which he knew it. And the truth is that even for the Christian church today, in the events of Ferguson, in the events of racism that we continue to see in our world, I have to ask myself, did the difference that Jesus made 2,000 years ago really make a difference today? Is the church really about standing for the poor and for the oppressed and for the marginalized and for those on the sidelines of society? Or have we been really very quiet in the face of the oppression and in the events of the young man whose life was taken. Now, we will never know the fullness of the facts of these stories. You know, everybody has their own story, and I know that we have police uh, offices in our congregation this morning, and I don't want any one of our police officers to feel like we are picking on them in the same way that I also want to understand that so often the systems by which we live encourage us to marginalize peoples and not to bring about peace. But somehow our systems have been turned upside down. But I do want to challenge us today to think about for ourselves what systems we live under and how has the church made pretty this story to the reality of lives that we live amongst. I am sure you are not going to be very happy with this sermon series. It might look pretty on the outside, but sometimes we need to use this opportunity to get underneath the story. You know, the Christian church has been really good at making this story pretty white, and I used that pretty deliberately this morning. I, I was uh, at the Creative Arts Service just a couple of weeks ago, and the preacher that stood up to preach had a wonderful picture of Jesus. It was a picture that perhaps many of us have seen in churches throughout, uh, the, throughout this country and certainly in other countries. It was a great picture of this Lutheran Jesus. You know that wonderful picture of Jesus? It looks a little bit like Michael this morning with the long hair. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, in fact, Jesus had a little longer hair than you did. Thank you for growing it out this year just to make this moment possible. 
you know that, that picture of Jesus? You know, the preacher stood up and she held this lovely picture of Jesus up and she said, you can just imagine that God had just said to Jesus, oh, and you're going to be crucified. And he went, I wish she was here. She did it so much better than I did. But you know that, that picture that we get to see in most of our churches that have come from Europe to sent, that picture of Jesus that looks just as white as you possibly can do? And yet how many of us really would be comfortable to open the window and let in a Jesus that was not white? How, how many of us would really be comfortable to worship a Jesus that was black? Or, or how many of us would be comfortable worshiping a Jesus that was brown or, or yellow or, or, or some other color than the dominant culture that we find in our world today? You, you see, we have made this story look pretty and look just like us so that we are comfortable worshiping this Jesus. But the Jesus that we open the window to today is not a Jesus from our culture. This Jesus is a Jesus from Judaic culture who was a good rabbi who perhaps even never came to explore or even begin Christianity and certainly didn't come to begin a church but who came to understand and to build relationship with God's people to open the window and let him in to let this child of Jesus you see even that's not true his name was not Jesus. His name was Joshua. And yet in our culture, we have had to divorce ourselves from the, the Jewish tradition of Jesus by even changing his name to a Roman name in order that he would be acceptable to the masses. Oh, am I stirring us up a little bit this morning? <laughs> You see, and in the midst of that this morning, as we think about Ferguson and we think about the way in which we worship Jesus and the way that we, we experience this Jesus who sits before us this morning, we have to ask ourselves, was the black man Jesus? Was the Latino who is undocumented and who continues to offer their labor amongst us Jesus? Is the person living with HIV in our community who is in fear of coming out and saying, I am HIV positive this morning, is that Jesus? Who is this child that we are welcoming in this morning and how uncomfortable can we become before we would really experience this Jesus at all levels of this story? We have made this Jesus so comfortable for us. And in our society, in our country this morning, we are called as the hands and feet of Jesus to challenge the systems of oppression, the systems that continue to marginalize, the systems that continue to portray a Jesus of our understanding rather than the Jesus who came 2,000 years ago to a smelly stable, to an unmarried family, to a place of poverty. No wonder Jesus stood on the side of the poor. He knew what it felt like. No wonder Jesus stood on those who were ostracized from society as he had to run from where he was in fear that he might be killed by the authorities. He knew what it meant to be undocumented. He, he knew what it meant to be outside of the community looking in. He experienced all of these feelings so that when he came to the fullness of his ministry as an adult, he was able to speak not just theoretically but from his personal experience. And today, the Christian church, it looks so pretty. And in this Advent series, I sincerely hope that as we ask ourselves what a difference a baby makes, it might stir us up. Yes. Cause us too to stand against that dominant culture that would marginalize people just like you and me. You see, many of us know what that feels like. We've been on the outside looking in. We've been those who have been marginalized and oppressed. And the temptation for us is that we too can make our story look so pretty. 
We too can deny the oppression and the experiences of our lives in order to fit in to the society. Or we can use what we had just like Jesus to stand for others today who too are being left behind. The difference a baby makes. You know, it's really not that pretty. And I hope that when we come to Christmas Eve and the folks who perhaps only come to church on Christmas Eve and Easter, I, I hope that we as a church are so prepared to engage those folks who come, and that's no judgment about whether they come on Christmas Eve or Easter. I'm glad that they come at all. Uh, there are every reason not to come to church these days, more than there are to come. My prayer is that we might be so ready to receive that Jesus that those who come amongst us will see us as people who are living authentically this story that we preach week in and week out. I hope that as we prepare our hearts and minds for this Christmas, and you're not going to get all four sermons in one this morning. You have to keep coming back for them all. But I pray that we might have just stirred ourselves up a little bit so that we might be hungry for the liberation of a Christ who lives in your body and in mine, lives in the Latino woman's body, lives in the body living with HIV and AIDS, lives in the body of corporate America, lives in the body of one who is of service, who lives in the body that looks different than ours, but is nonetheless a child of God. What a difference a baby makes. You have to come back now. Two, uh, three years ago tomorrow, I entered the hospital and found out for the first time that I was HIV positive. Um, started me on a journey of, at first I was, I need to make sure my house is in order. So Harry and I went and we went to Forest Lawn and decided to 
look at stuff. The very next week, we went to Disneyland, and we said, oh, the heck with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to be around a while. We'll just uh, buy a timeshare so that we can travel and stuff like that. So the, the, the theme of, of tomorrow and hopefully into the future is, you know, life is living. You know, it, it, life. There are those of us, some of us, have survived for many years and will go on to live normal lives. Where if we pass, it is because it is our time. In Luke 9:60, it says, Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you proclaim the dominion of God. So it's time for us to start um, living a little bit. I want to—I I need to correct Reverend Neil a little bit on the on the quilt here. This is merely my panel. Okay, we're working on a project to celebrate life. Those of us who are living with HIV and AIDS, and we're this—we're launching it now. And I wanted to share that with you. If you want to know more, come tomorrow night. Um, we'll explain a little bit more. And I say all this because we have so much that we can do. So much more, but we need your help. So I ask that you think about what it is you can do, how much you can give, and that you do so with a thankful heart. Thank you. And there is a second offering today for our, our work in Tijuana, our hospice. So um, I want you to think about that as part of what you can do this World AIDS Day. Thank you. Yeah, 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 God. 
Just to allow those words and the spirit and the energy to wash over us as we reflect. Mm. If God was one of us, yes. please pray with me. Gracious God of so many names, but especially this day, you are a gracious God of hope. Place your healing arms around all who are affected by HIV AIDS not only in this congregation, but around the world. As we prepare for the coming of your son into this world on this Sunday of Advent of hope, we give thanks for signs of hope, for the growing understanding towards our sisters and brothers, as well as for medical advances being made, for changing our attitudes and behavior toward those who are not only infected with HIV AIDS, but to all those who have life-threatening diseases. God of unity, bind us together with strong ties of love that this church community may be a place where all can find acceptance. May it be a place of welcome for all affected by HIV AIDS, as well as a place where care is given and received. Mm -hmm. Let our stories be told and heard from those who are living today as we celebrate their lives through you. As our fears are overcome by love and where you are to be found in and through each one of us. Creator God, there is so much we do not know or understand about ourselves and our world. Yet we are like children opening our presence and finding the wrapping is as interesting as the contents. We offer our praise and thanksgiving for the gifts of curiosity and imagination. Take us into the Advent and the New Year with our wonder, delight, and creativity intact as we offer praise and thanksgiving. Give us thankful, 
and grateful hearts. Lord, as we pray in the words of Jesus, as we sing. Advent is a season of waiting and, wa waiting and watching, of preparing and praying, of hoping and hearing. In a brief moment of silence, let us come to God, speaking of how easily we become distracted from the, the simple acts of Advent discipleship. Together we join our voices as one as we pray together, saying, Word of flesh, have mercy. Friend of the poor, have mercy. Bridegroom of the faithful, have mercy. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven and forgiving people. Now in this season of waiting, hear the good news. Mercy, new life, hope and joy are the gifts we receive from our God. Thanks be to God of Advent, who came in the child, making a difference, who is with us in the spirit, and who will come again in the glory. Amen. In our great prayer of thanksgiving, we are reminded that the approaching God is with you. And, and also with you. you. Open your hearts to our God, dear friends. We long to be filled with grace and hope. Sing songs to the potter of our lives. We rejoice in the one who shapes us in new life. You could no longer wait, patient God, and so tore open chaos, laughing in pure delight as creation poured forth. Therefore, with all those who are awake and alert, with those who nod off while waiting, we sing our praises to you.
or on the night when those that who gathered closest with Jesus around a table, he took a bread, a loaf of bread, and he took it and he said, this is my body to be broken for you. Whenever you do this and share this meal, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, following the supper, he took from the table a cup. Some say it was the cup of Elijah the prophet. He raised it and he blessed it, and he offered it to them saying, drink of this, and each time you drink of this, do this, remembering me. Please pray with me. Wait no longer, God who comes to us, but pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of the sacred meal that your children might be restored. We may not know how, but the broken bread strengthens us to go feed the hungry, to bring healing to the hurting, to carry the burdens of others. May the cup of grace open our eyes so we may see the injustices around us, so we may challenge them. The oppression of others so we may break it the fears of those around us, so that we may relieve them. Then when we can wait no longer, gather your children from every time and every place, seating us around your feast, which awaits us as we praise you forever and ever, forever. God in community, holy in one. Amen. Amen. At this time, we invite those who are with us online to get some juice and some bread or cookies, milk, whatever that is your preference to celebrate with us this morning at the table. And for those of you that are with us this morning here at Founders Metropolitan Community Church, as well as all of our Metropolitan Community Churches worldwide, we celebrate an open communion. And what that is is that you don't need to be a member of this church or any church to receive this morning. All we ask is that you want to receive and come be a part of this table. In a moment, the ushers will guide you to stations in front where we'll take a wafer and dip it in non-alcoholic grape juice. We'll offer you a brief blessing and then invite you to go back to your seat and to take time to medicate. If you wish to receive communion this morning just between you and your God, there is a station of elements to your right for you to take part in that. There is no time to not be a part of the table and be a part of what God has created us to be in the children of God. So this time we invite the acolytes and service to join us and invite you to be a part of the table this morning.
What if God was one of us? Yes. Well, the truth is, God is one of us. In Ferguson, in Mexico, in East LA, in Los Feliz, in Silver Lake, in West Hollywood, in Beverly Hills. <laughs> well, maybe. So, <laughs> I pray that what we have shared this morning reminds us the difference a baby makes. Let's rise as we close worship in song. to God's gracious mercy and protection each and every one of us is given and the blessing of God known to us as creator savior and holy spirit be with us and remain with us now and evermore amen, amen. go in peace
you for joining us today. By participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry, our extended fellowship. Whether you're tuning in from Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, or Zimbabwe, wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. All of the people you've just seen in this broadcast, not just the ministers and the choir, but every person sitting on those pews, we are here for you. So please, why don't you connect with us? Interact with us. We have four ways you can do that. Telephone, email, Facebook, and Twitter. And all of those links are located at the bottom of every webpage of our website at mccla.org. With your help, we can not just continue, but expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. Be a video angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donate link located just under the support menu in the upper right corner of any page of our website. Your participation is very important. And I want to invite you to write to me and let me know how I can be in prayer and praise with you. Even though you are not here in our worship center, you are still a part of MCCLA. Email me directly at revneal at mccla.org. May God bless your life. And I look forward to welcoming you back many, many times to MCCLA and our weekly live broadcast. You are.